personally, I can't think of why you would need to have a meeting all day. I can't imagine there's that much to say. But um, so I have a meeting in the morning and then I'll have a meeting all day until four o'clock. So um, I'm going to go ahead and have you guys take notes for what we need to the rest of the presentation. So hydrogen fuel, we haven't talked about hydrogen fuel yet. We have abundant resources for this. It wouldn't take too much to mine it because of the fact that we get it from the H2O molecule. So water molecule. So what we do is we take an immense amount of energy. You guys actually did this experiment at the beginning of the year, the hydrolysis experiment, where we took water and we separated the hydrogen from the oxygen and then we lit the hydrogen on fire. That explosion is basically how engines work um, and we can use this hydrogen fuel to fuel cars. Now one of the huge benefits from this is the fact that hydrogen fuel when burned, remember this is a chemical reaction, when you light hydrogen on fire, uh, usually combustion reactions are reacting with oxygen and with a, a large release of, of heat energy. So we combine hydrogen, H2, with O, and it becomes water again. Now, one of the really cool things with that is the fact that instead of having CO2 get into the air, um, instead of having nitrous compounds get into the air, instead of having mercury, like for other fossil fuels, when we do syn fuels with like coal, for example, uh, we're really not having a huge uh, byproduct from this. Now, one of the problems with the hydrogen fuel is one, it's a negative net energy. So we're getting less energy out of it than we're putting into it. Um, did I say that right? We're getting less energy out of it than we put into it to create the fuel. Now, some people argue that it wouldn't be that big a deal if we just had a solar cell. Let's say you had a hydrogen fueled car, you went home, um, at night and you filled your, your car up with hydrogen fuel because there was a solar cell from the sun that was just wasted anyway beating down on your rooftop and that that split the um, hydrogen from the oxygen and then voila you have hydrogen fuel yeah it costs more energy than you put into it but it was a solar cell so it's not like it, it was a big deal it just was sitting there soaking up the sun anyhow so that is kind of a viable idea from it now kind of basic fuel cell basically uh, you've got some that can have oxygen on one side uh, you've got hydrogen on the other side and in the engine we're going to be putting uh, lighting this on fire and then we be producing uh, water out from it so basically we have this battery we have the anode the cathode and as these are moving uh, they're they're coming through they're reacting with the oxygen and then we're producing water and we're getting, stop it, electricity out from that. Now the advantages here um, can be produced from water or salt water. And then when we burn it, it just goes back into the atmosphere. It helps clean the atmosphere. Um, and, and yeah, it is a potent greenhouse gas, but we can only hold so much water vapor into the atmosphere. Um, it, it, because of temperature and so most of it would just um, eke out of the atmosphere as long as we weren't ke continuing re raising earth's temperatures with other greenhouse gases like co2 or methane or cfc's um so another one there is is we have no carbon dioxide emissions or s carbon monoxide either it's a good substitute for oil it burns into water vapor we already kind of talked about these it high energy it, it, high energy, sorry, efficiency in fuel cells if you can get it to actually do a fuel cell. So a fuel cells sometimes will split the water and then recombine the water so it uses the energy of the car to do that process. Um, however, it's a, and you can't see that because my face is in the way, negative net energy because of the high energy input to produce it. Um, it has very high cost, so to make it viable, we'd have to have government subsidies. And then here's a big problem right here. It says there's no good way to store the gas. The gas itself um, is hydrogen. It is the smallest of our elements, and so there's not really a container that contains it well. 
So the hydrogen will eventually leak out of any container that we have it in because the molecules will just, they're so small, they kind of, they eke out of the spaces, in between the spaces of other molecules that a container is, is made up of. So we have no good viable way to contain it without maybe reacting with other chemicals, and then you've got a possible um, pollution issue there. So there's no distri distribution system also currently in place. There's some natural gas um, places where you can fill up your car with natural gas as opposed to gasoline, which is cleaner. Um, but we don't have exactly like uh, hydrogen gas stations. Um, also, it's highly flammable. If you've ever heard of the Hindenburg or heard the quote, oh, the humanity, that comes from this. This thing was filled with hydrogen to help it float because it's so small. Um, but it did light itself on fire. It's very highly flammable. It's hard to contain, and the whole thing lit up, and I don't think anyone survived from that, um, that Zeppelin there. Um, take a second if you need to pause to write this down, but I'm going to go ahead and continue. So have the sub push the pause if you need me to slow down. So why does renewable energy only provide 8% of the world's um, energy. Now this is an old statistic. We're actually producing somewhere around 16-ish percent, so almost that 20 percent mark, al almost one-fifth of the world's energy. Um, but there might be old statistics on the exam, so we're going to keep this number-ish. Um, part of that is, and some of you have, have noticed this on your, you put it on your assignments I've already seen, that it's tax breaks. Tax break subsidies and research and development favor the fossil fuel industry. A lot of our subsidies are written into law that fossil fuel industries will get subsidies every single year. So there's consistency. Now for renewable energy, those tax breaks, those subsidies, all of that stuff it has to be renewed by Congress, um, a much of them every single year. So there's kind of a risk to it of Will I have the money next year to keep funding my project? Will I not have the money? Will my business have to go under because the costs are more than we can afford to be able to produce this energy? And so because we have to depend on that, a lot of investors don't want to invest in something, invest a lot of money into something that may have to just go under the next year because the government funding has fallen through. So there's, there's that dependability that the fossil fuels have with their subsidies that renewable energy does not. Uh, renewable, renewable, gosh dang it. No, you guys, you guys, I know you're thinking, hey, she has another misspelling there. You just don't know how to read. All right, ren renewable energy, that should be say renewable, just shut up. I know all of you are laughing right now. Just shut up. Okay, renewable energy subsidies and tax breaks need to be renewed each year. We kind of already talked about this, creating uncertainty for um, investors. And then here's a big one in the book that it talked about, and I'm not going to read it, and then we'll talk about it in a second. Um, but full cost pricing is not included in fossil fuels. So we talked about um, rules of sustainability. One of those is full cost pricing, meaning the full cost from cradle to grave should be included in that um, price that you buy at the pump. Now what that means is from cradle, from mining it, pull it out of the ground, all the way until we put it to bed. Or So like in the example of nuclear fuel energy, that would be until all the radioactivity, uh, radioactive material and fuel rods are stored in their... Uh, forever containers. So here in this case, fossil fuels, we pay, depending if it's summer or not, about $4 a gallon for fossil fuels. But the true cost of fossil fuels should probably be somewhere between $10 and $12 a gallon. And part of that is because government subsidies help offset the cost to the consumers. So that's a big bonus for us, especially for those who drive and they have to drive to get to work. Um, anybody that has to travel on a vehicle to get to work, whether that's train or by a uh, motor vehicle. Um, but that's not the main cost there. So we also have to consider the pollution that it puts into the air, the cost to human health, um, the 
added cases of people who have asthma now because we have this pollution in the air and, and it's causing young people who wouldn't have had asthma to begin with to have that asthma and then have that debilitating issue for the rest of their lives. We're not talking about um, loss of, oh, 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 I've totally, income that might be related to illnesses from fossil fuels. And we're also not calculating in the extra environmental cost that this pollution does to our natural environment and what that plays out in the long run. So, and I think the book also listed waiting in traffic, like traffic jams. Um, okay, I guess that could be a, a, a attributed to fossil fuels and that could be, you know, because fossil fuels are so cheap, everybody has a car and nobody wants to carpool, so there are more cars on the road. So I guess that's kind of what they're saying there, but driving to work, instead of it taking a half an hour, maybe take an hour, hour and a half, because there's so more vehicles on the road. When I lived in Connecticut, definitely the case. Places that were 20, 30 minutes away could take anywhere from 40 minutes to two hours just to get to work in the morning. It was horrible. That's why we just decided to use the train instead. Um, so yeah, you've got you've to factor in those other prices that we pay as a society for having these fossil fuels. And that's not to mention the added uh, carbon dioxide that adds to the air, increasing the greenhouse effect, which uh, leads to more global warming. All right, so fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, nothing wrong with that word either. Fossil fuels are abundant and artificially cheap. So, so, yeah. Anyway, so coal, United States is one of the biggest providers in coal. It's still bugging me. I'm just going to put my finger on it so I, I can't see it anymore. So fossil fuels, uh, we have a lot of coal in the United States, a lot of coal. Most of it's very dirty coal. Um, we have almost no anthracite, uh, mostly biotuminous coal, and then uh, lignite as well, which is like brown coal is what they call that a lot. It's very, very dirty, not as processed as the other coals. Remember, the more pressurized, the more it is closer to that metamorphic anthracite, the cleaner it becomes. Um, so we've got a huge supply in the United States of coal. Um, so it's really, really cheap for us to have coal here. Um, also, we have plenty of tar and, and those kind of fossil fuels in our tar sands in the United States and up in Canada as well. So I know a lot of people are like, well, we're going to run out of fossil fuels eventually, so we should just switch to nuclear, not nuclear, but um, cleaner energy sources. Well, kind of, but it's kind of not really true. I mean, yeah, all of our fossil fuels that are viably um, mineable, that's not a word, but I'm going to pretend it is, uh, we'll probably run out of all of them within the next 500 years, but that's a really long time. What the real problem is, is they create a lot of pollution, a lot of land disruption, a lot of ecosystem disruption, and they cause a lot of human health issues. We should just stop using them and use something cleaner because we have the technology. We could make it com competitive, um, and it just makes sense. All right, if you still need to write stuff down, pause. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. Move on. Thank you. All right, so energy efficiency. We lose a lot of our energy that we generate just to inefficiency. So 84% of all the energy that we create is actually lost and never actually used in, like, outlets or in its, you know, intended destination. 43% of that is just due to inefficient light bulbs or inefficient engines. We have a lot of those in the United States. Um, we lose a lot of heat just to heat leaving buildings. So we lose a lot of inefficient. So let me zoom in on this. So here is a radar image. So it's, it's basically a thermal scan of two different buildings. This building looks really, really cold on the outside 
because the heat is being contained on the inside. Here, we're losing heat everywhere where there's a warm location. So here, this building is just not very well insulated, and we're just losing a lot of heat to the outside. We've got a lot of insulation in the roof, but everywhere else, pretty much, we're losing heat in this situation. So improving efficiency of our motor vehicles, improving the efficiency of um, just a home, and just switching out to more efficient light bulbs, we come out with more efficient light bulbs every single year, um, would help that efficiency. So energy inefficient devices, another one would be um, huge data centers that just hold things in the cloud. If you have ever heard someone, hey, I'm gonna store that in the cloud, um, basically they're referring to storing on the internet. Now the internet, it's not just this magical place that doesn't exist. When you're storing stuff on the internet, you're storing it on a specific computer, uh, usually a server that's located in a building that has power to keep it going. So um, data centers, a lot of computers, we lose a lot of that energy to heat energy in the computer. And so we're, yeah, we're, we're using a lot of energy just to run things on the internet and, and to store things on the internet. Um, internal combustion engines, that's a, cars, vehicles, um, are gonna be internal combustion engines. We lose a lot of that to heat energy. Um, nuclear power plants, again, heat energy loss like crazy. Um, we talked about cogeneration. I hope we talked about cogeneration. If we didn't, um, nuclear power plants, they let a lot of that heat energy in the cooling tower just escape out into the environment. In when they could be using that heat and pumping it through their building to keep the building warm, um, cogeneration would be using that excess heat that would be lost to the environment and, and be useless and kind of reusing it for another purpose. So if they were able to take that heat and instead of piping the water to a cooling tower where a lot of the heat would evaporate off or, or you know leave off and before they return it to the environment, if they could pump that to the building until it cooled down, um, it would give heat to the building. Now currently they're gonna be using electricity or they're gonna be using gas, um, most of the time electricity that they generate there at, to produce their heat. So they produce some of their energy and then they they burn it so it'd be better just to use their waste heat energy to heat the building and then coal fire power plant same thing we have a lot of heat loss in the in the coal fire plant when it could be used to uh, for heating for the the factory all right so what we could do is increase efficiency um, that would help prolong fossil fuel supplies also, we don't have to burn as much if we're doing it more efficiently. So we're gonna have less pollution because of that. Uh, we can also reduce oil import and improve energy security. We don't have as much dependency on foreign oil. That makes us a little bit more safe here in the United States. Um, that would help lower costs as well because again, um, more efficiency, less usage, less usage, less cost. Obviously, less usage, less pollution, and environmental degradation. And it also helps us to buy more time to implement better technologies for things like our renewables, like our wind energy, our hydroelectric energy, um, our solar energies. And then also it would help create local jobs. So there's our economic, um, most of these are economic, but good economic boom there to the local Okay, I guess we didn't talk about cogeneration. I'm going to talk about cogeneration now. Um, <laughs> so, coal plants are considered um, low on efficiency because of the fact that you're you're getting a lot of stuff. You have to mine it. You put a lot of energy into it to get it out of the ground, get it to the place, and then you're burning it, and you're not getting a lot of that energy out to electricity. You're transferring a lot of it, and you're losing a lot of it to heat energy as you burn it. So cogeneration, kinda already said this, but note it now, is the idea of capturing heat loss in generating electricity for energy needs, such as capturing heat uh, given off by the actual production of whatever you're making. So this would be uh, firing coal. That energy, that heat energy that's that's lost, could be used to warm up the plant instead of electricity or um, 
natural gas. I forgot what we used for heating for a minute. All right, now smart grid. It talks about the smart grid a little bit in um, the book. Uh, but the idea of a smart grid is basically you have a lot of different energy generation. And, and a lot of times they, they emphasize clean energy here, but it doesn't have to be. Where basically everybody is connected on a massive grid system. Um, not only the power plant, but individual homes. Everybody is connected into this one big grid system. Now, one thing there is it helps efficiency. If one place doesn't need uh, electricity, it's going to send it to another location nearby. It'll also help tell plants to stop producing when we have enough. It also has little sensors on it that kind of are able to gather data to be able to predict when people are going to be using electricity, when customers are not using electricity. Now, on this diagram, it looks really, really small. I mean, for me, if I was looking at this, I would assume this is a city like Layton, um, except for the fact that there's high-rise buildings here. But this is, think of this more on a much larger scale on maybe multiple cities, multiple states wide. So if there's a rolling power outage in California because they're going through a heat wave and everyone's using their air conditioners, the smart grid would detect that. And before the power outage would go out, it would take excess power from Washington or Idaho that isn't being used. And it can tell those plants to produce more and transfer the energy to those locations to reduce the risk of these power outages. And same thing for the dead of winter, if you want to think of that. Um, think about Wisconsin and the freezing, freezing frost that they're in right now. Now, again, we don't use electricity for heat all that much, but a smart grid can transfer the power to where it's needed the most and kind of be able to be predictive as well. All right, almost there. I promise we're almost there. All right, so fuel efficient vehicles. If we look at Europe, which doesn't suck for the environment as much as we do, it makes me kind of upset, but um, our average mile per hour for U.S. vehicles is, is right here. It's, no, that's 2016. Stop, 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 stop. Is 24, let's say 25 miles a gallon. So, you can drive 25 miles uh, per gallon. Now, we were supposed to be at 29, 20, uh, uh, 30 miles per gallon, but for some reason we didn't meet our goal and no one got mad at the car manufacturers, so whatever. Um, but with our current technologies that we have now, we should be able to have vehicles that can have efficiency up to 100 miles per gallon. Now, currently, same year, so 2016, Europe, their average new vehicles are at 45.4 miles per gallon. Now, some of that is because of hybrid vehicles. Um, so what they have, one, they've made the, the engine much more efficient. And two, um, they have hybrid cars. So let's first let's talk about this. So creating vehicles that are more fuel efficient starts with a carbon dioxide tax. So Europe, a uh, pretty unilaterally have said, okay, let's carbon tax everything. Everything that produces carbon to the atmosphere that's going to increase global warming, that's going to harm the planet, we're going to put a heavy tax on it. So what this did was incentivize people to want to purchase cars that were more efficient. So kind of think of it being evolution a little bit. Um, it made an option more appealing for people. So let's say it's like a peacock feather, like the really sexy feathers. So all the ladies like the, the male with the, the pretty key peacock feathers. But in this case, it's the people looking for the hybrid cars that have the most efficiency. So they're going to be looking after that instead because they don't want to pay this huge carbon tax, which makes their uh, commute to work much, much more expensive. So it was very uh, effective in, in kind of making manufacturers produce cars that didn't cost so much to run. Um, so they began manufacturing more hybrid cars. Now a hybrid car is, there are a few different hybrid cars, but a basic one would be, it has a gas engine and it also has an electric engine. And it can use both of those 
And so it has the electric engine, and when it runs out of that, it can it can run off of electricity. Um, so in the United States, the hybrid cars aren't as popular because they're really, really expensive. They're not really worth the cost. Even if you have like a solar panels like I have at my house, um, it's still much more expensive to drive back and forth between work. So this would be an example of where government subsidies would definitely come in handy, helping to offset those costs to consumers and then it helps make a shift in the society. But honestly, a carbon tax is, is a much better idea. So we could also increase energy efficiency through hydrogen fuel cells, but we're gonna skip that because literally we just don't have a good viable way to hold that stuff, so we're not using it. I also design better buildings. So here's what I like to call the Hobbit house. Um, it's got a lot of insulation and it's basically an earthen home where earth as in the planet or the the ground surface is insulating a lot of the house so it stays cool in the summer without air conditioning and it's pretty warm using minimal heating during the winter um, here's another example of that type of house where it's built kind of into a hillside so you've got all of this ground here insulating the the house and then the front has its light here and then I don't know I think it'd be kind of dark in the house but um here's another example of that so here this is, these are example of green roofs they're not really earthen covered but the roofs themselves are have a cooling effect um, grass definitely cools the area around it. Sometimes we plant grass next to an airstrip, especially when in really hot places, because that helps cool down the area because of transpiration. That transpiration process takes heat from the atmosphere and evaporates water into the air. So these roofs not only help insulate, but they also help cool with that evaporative process. So here's an example of a green roof. We've got plants that are planted on the side. And sometimes people make these green roofs um, like kind of a vegetable garden. And then here, these are green walls where they've planted the plants on the wall. And again, they also help suck in carbon dioxide so and other pollutants as well. They actually help clean the air. Um, another technique here deciduous trees you guys probably read that in the textbook hopefully you all have already read the chapter but if you haven't read it and um, do the work on that but deciduous tree a deciduous tree is I mean you probably have heard the word evergreen tree which is a tree that has typically needles but it doesn't have to have needles but it's green all year long meaning evergreen it, it kind of makes sense but a deciduous tree is a tree that that often resides in um, temperate climates that can get hot in the summer but really really cold in winter and so it has the four seasons and they'll tend to lose their leaves in the fall to protect themselves from broken branches uh, when the snowfall comes so deciduous trees are really good because if you can see this is the bright summer time where it's shading the house it's helping to keep that sun off of there, turning that light energy to heat radiation. So it cools the house, or I guess keeps it cool, keeps it from heating. And then in the winter time, it doesn't have any leaves. So the sun gets through most of the plant itself. And in the winter, it helps to heat up the house. So this is a very passive uh, technique that works really, really well. Um, let's see other pictures I wanna show you. Oh, so here's just a diagram of the green roof. So basically we've got, this is what you would normally have on your roof, your plywood here down below. And then you've got your waterproofing. And then here they've got like a styrofoam insulation and then some layers to keep that insulation fully protected. So this would be like a impermeable layer, like a layer of rubber or plastics that would go over top of this. And then here we've got um, some absorptive material Usually some just like, it kind of looks like material, like clothes you would wear. And then we have these other layers to help uh, filter and drain the water out of the soil so we don't get mold growing in here because you don't want mold infecting everything else below and, and ruining your house. And then they have plants up here that are um, usually native plants that can survive the conditions so you don't have to water your roof because that would be kind of 
pointless. All right, so here are a bunch of techniques. This list is just a giant list of techniques that you can use. One, uh, maximize natural lighting. So that's an example here, here, sorry, in this photo here, where they've got uh, sunlights up here. Not only is it sunlight, but it actually opens to allow ventilation to come through the house. So they've got a lot of natural lights, so we don't ever need to use lights during the daytime. Um, solar heating, so that's going to be um, our water heater. Instead of having natural gas heat the water heater, you can have um, solar light. You can have light heating it up. Um, so insulation windows. Most people have insulated windows now. If you have a really old house, you might have a single pane window that doesn't have like a vacuum layer between uh, to kind of reduce that heat loss from the windows. Energy efficient appliances and lighting. So that would be having energy efficient um, dishwashers, washing machines, uh, refrigerators would be example, and lighting would be efficient light bulbs. For example, here, we just compare these three light bulbs here. This incandescent light bulb, which most of you probably don't have anymore. Most of those have been replaced in almost everybody's houses. Um, 40 watts, use 40 watts of energy here. This spiral bulb, which a lot of you probably have, it, it only takes about nine watts of energy. And then we have these LED lights. Um, they're kind of new-ish within the last five years. The five-year-old ones aren't that great. They, they take a while to warm up. They're kind of annoying. But uh, the newer ones are much better. So here it only takes seven watts of, of energy, and they give off the same amount of light. This one actually says it gives off more light than these two. So a comparable light you're getting comparable light out, um, but you're putting less energy in. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about efficiency. All right, you should probably be writing these techniques down, by the way. You'll want to use a lot of these techniques in your home design that we'll be doing today. All right, so where am I at? Solar water heaters. I kind of already talked about that with the solar heating. Um, electricity from solar cells. So that would be photovoltaic cells there. Um, Automatic tinting windows. So you can have windows that when the light is really high in the middle of the day, they tint a little bit so they don't heat up your house as much. So they block some of the light coming in. Um, insulative walls, adding insulation to the roof. Um, thicker walls uh, that are very insulated that come in contact with the outside are very, very helpful. Um, recycling of waste water. So here on this one, I don't think I have an image of this one. So basically, we have our gray water and we have our black water. Our black water needs most of the time to be uh, treated either in a septic tank or it needs to go to a facility that, that will treat the water and neutralize it. Our gray water would be example of dishwash water or the washing machine or um, you took a bath. Um, any water that doesn't have uh, I was going to say excrement, but pee, feces and pee, pee and pee and poo. If it doesn't have those in it, it will be classified as gray water. And that water can actually be sort of slowly released to your yard and be the water source for your yard. And it kind of, the, the plants will take care of, of the excess things in there, like the nitrates from your wash, um, from your soaps and stuff like that. And the environment will take those things and they'll reincorporate it back into the environment and clean up the water. So um, instead of using excess water to water your yard, you can use the water you were already getting rid of and kind of recycle that water through your yard system. Anyway, so living roofs and green roofs. Um, I already showed you a few examples of those. Super insulation, I actually don't know what that means, so I'm going to skip that. Um, sealing air leaks, um, if you can feel air coming in from the outside, you're not being as efficient as you could be. Also, automatic motion sensor lights. We have those here at the school. I know me and Miss Morrill always complain because if we're sitting over at our computers working uh, the lights don't think we exist, and we have to move to the middle of the room to get the lights to go back on because we can't see. Uh, but it's really good for when you're not using a room, or especially at businesses where people will leave the lights on because it's not their house. Why would they turn the light off? You know, someone else might be using this room. Um, it'll automatically turn it off so that it's not wasted electricity. We have those all over the building. Um, 
earth shelter. So, so those earthen homes I showed you, earth sheltering, that's what that is called there. That's number 14 right there. So that's basically the ground or um, Bill Gates. Bill Gates' house is very earth sheltered. If you want to look up that, he's basically built his house into the side of a mountain and they use very, very little um, heating and air conditioning because of that. And then also we are talking about planting deciduous trees in deciduous shade trees. I don't I don't see a spelling error there either. Um, deciduous shade or shad trees. Um, I'm going to go with shade trees. And we already discussed it, how that's helpful. So you might want to make some notes there. And then also having light colored roofs. Dark colors absorb more light energy. And the more light energy that something absorbs, the more it can turn into heat energy. So if we go around having black roads and black roofs, we're going to be absorbing a lot of heat energy. So if we live like, I don't know, in a desert like we do in Utah and the summers get rather hot, it's a good idea to have a white roof. Now if you're thinking, well, what if in the winter I want to absorb a lot of heat and so I want to have a black roof? Well, if you can have a roof that can switch back and forth, that'd be great. But I don't know if you noticed, but most of the time the roofs, well, at least they used to be before a lot of this warming happened. The roofs were covered in snow, so it didn't matter what color your roof was during the winter. So a wider roof is important to help uh, reflect that light back out and leave less to be absorbed. And then, you know, awesome thing here would be geothermal heat pumps because they are the most efficient um, use of, of energy and they are very, very high efficiency. All right, now I know Nathan's tired of listening to my voice, so um, luckily for Nathan, that's the end of the entire thing that we need to have for this. But that also means that we're having a test come up for chapter 14 through 16. You need to start studying your notes. There's a lot of stuff that we have covered in these three chapters, probably more than we have in any other unit um, as one unit itself. So make sure you start studying now a little bit at a time. Remember, cramming a lot before the test isn't going to help for long-term memory. And if you're actually planning on to take the test, which all of you should be, we need to have long-term memory. So you're going to study for a little bit, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes today, 20, 30 minutes tomorrow, 20, 30 minutes the next day. Do it gradually. Next time, we will not have the exam. Next time, we're going to do something you all are going to hate, and you're going to be crying and screaming because we're going to do... We're going to do math. Sorry. This unit has a lot of math in it. And we're going to do it. But, um, so the time after that, we will have the test. Now, the next thing you're going to do today in class is you are going to create a home build design. Now, you can do one of two options. You can design the perfect home that uses passive solar techniques, uh, solar techniques, wh whatever you think is going to work. Or you can design a sort of fix or alternative, a way to make a home that's already built more efficient. So if you want to take your own home and build your home and say, okay, what could we do to fix the efficiency of our house. Now remember to use some of these techniques here that, that help us design better buildings. Keep those in mind. Keep those passive and solar um, options in mind as well. And I'm going to leave. I'm hope I'm going to leave. We'll see what time I have tonight to, to make this. But I want to leave an example for you in your home design to kind of show you what I'm looking for. But you're going to have call out boxes anywhere where like you have some kind of efficiency or some special build in there or something you've done on purpose to collect sunlight or to be super efficient. You're going to note that in some kind of call out box and explain that to me and explain how that thing that you're using, name it by name, and explain to that me how that is actually helping your house be more efficient. So you have the rest of the period today to work on that. So that's, I don't know, probably not very much because I talk a lot. Um, and it will be due next time. So make sure you're not talking and you're working really hard on your home build design. Um, 
you will not submit that to Canvas. That will be a physical thing that you bring in next class period. Now, last thing I want to tell you, you should have chapter 14 done. You should have chapter 15 done. And I already think I already told you that you should have chapter 16 done by Monday of this week. So you would have time to do the home build design. Um, so if you don't already have 14, 15 done, get them done immediately. If you're almost done with 16, get that done within the next day or two. Um, and then the home design, everything is due the 6th at midnight, except for the home design that will be due in class next time. All right, see ya.